everybody. So we, good evening, everybody. Good evening. We'd like to welcome you on behalf of Mount Mexico Institute of Black Studies to our Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration. Um, but we have a special guest with us um, who is a great keynote, and I hope you guys have your mind open um, and ready for some questions at the end. How uh, tonight will go. Um, I will introduce um, our own President Feller, who will then introduce another guest that we have here, who will finally introduce our guest um, in our campus. And then after that, we'll have a Q&A session where we'll be able to ask our keynote speakers questions. Um, and so again, please listen effectively, make sure that we're um, cell phones are down, or if you're recording something, make sure that you know what you're going to ask or record the questions down um, so that you know what you're going to do at the end. Um, and then here's a quote that I want to share with you guys my favorite Martin Luther King Jr. quote that I think resonates with all wild ass men. Um, and that quote is The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And these are challenging and controversial times that we're going through right now. And so as Wild Batch Man, we should step up to the plate. Um, and I hope you all have goals to make sure that we can accomplish the things that we need to accomplish during these hard times. But with that, I would like to um, welcome President Scott Hill to the city. Thank you, everyone. It's my great honor to welcome you here this evening as we celebrate the life and legacy of the Reverend Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Dr. King was an advocate for peace at a time of sweeping change and disruption. He was an advocate for the poor, the less educated, and the underserved. He led an international conversation on the fight for basic human dignity for all people. He was a passionate and inspiring leader and one of the great orators of our time. And he was just 39 years old when he was assassinated in Memphis. Uh, I'm at a point in my life where I consider someone age 39 to be a young guy. Uh, and reflecting on both the amazing work that he accomplished uh, in those short years, and at a time, as Alan mentioned, of great division, I also can't help but think about how we might benefit from his ethical leadership if he was still here today. On Saturday, he would have celebrated his 93rd birthday. So it's wise that we come together to reflect on some of Dr. King's thoughts at this time when our nation is angry, disillusioned, and uncertain. Our world longs for the strong ethical leadership that Alan called our students to provide. Dr. King said, people fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they've not communicated with each other. At Wabash, I'd like to think we strive to be a place where difference is honored. We strive to cultivate integrity and courage in each of our young men and to be a place where young men learn to live humanely. It's my hope that Wabash can be a place where we communicate with each other, understand each other, and get along with each other, as called for by Dr. King. I'll close with another quote from Dr. King that I went to thinking about not maybe the division of our time, but maybe the struggles of our time as we continue to uh, battle the COVID-19 pandemic. He wrote, as my sufferings mounted, I soon realized there were two ways in which I could respond to my situation, either to react in bitterness or seek to transform the suffering into a creative force. I decided to follow the latter course. Tonight, as we remember the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., it's right that we challenge ourselves to be that creative force. It helps bend the arc of history towards justice and equity for all. At this point, it's my honor to welcome Crawfordsville Mayor Todd Barton to the stage, who will introduce our speaker for tonight. Welcome, Mayor Barton.
probably with a mask. <laughs> um, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's an honor for me to be a part of tonight's event and to introduce our keynote speaker. I have to use an iPad because her accomplishments are so many, I'll never remember them all. The Honorable Karen Freeman Wilson began serving as president and CEO of the Chicago Urban League in January of 2020. She brings a passion for equity and social justice to the organization which works to advance economic, educational, and social programs for African Americans through direct service and advocacy. Having served in the public arena most of her professional life, Freeman Wilson has deep experience in addressing issues that impact urban communities. She was mayor of her hometown of Gary, Indiana from 2012 through 2019. She was the first female to lead the city of Gary and the first African-American female mayor of Indiana. Her mayoral accomplishments <coughs> in job creation, completion of a $100 million airport runway, the location and the development of key areas in the city. She previously served as Indiana Attorney General, Director of Indiana Civil Rights Commission, and Presiding Judge of Gary City Court. She also served as Executive Director of the National Drug Court Institute and as CEO of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, <coughs> where she is currently board chair. Freeman Wilson is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. He is past president of the National League of Cities, past advisory board member of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and sits on the National Peace Foundation, the Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund, the African American Mayor's Advisory Board, a Director and Bipartisan Policy Center Council, and Kaufman Mayor's Advisory Council. He is a member of Israel CME <coughs> Church, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, the Lynx Incorporated. The NAACP, the James K. Rattle Bar, and the Indiana Bar. Freeman Wilson and her husband, Carmen Wilson II, have a blended family of four children. And I first met Perry during her tenure as mayor of Gary, and I can assure you with absolute certainty that no one has ever worked harder on behalf of Gary, Indiana, or its residents than Mayor Freeman Wilson. She is what I refer to as a truly impactful mayor. She is the very embodiment of a true leader, someone who has put service above self and dedicated her life to making the world around her a better place. I know she will have some powerful, thought-provoking words for us this evening as we reflect on the legacy of Dr. King and consider how we continue his work to fully live up to our potential as a nation. Ladies and gentlemen, Please give a warm, Wabash, and Providence welcome to my friend and colleague, Karen Freeman Wilson. To our president, Scott Feller, to all of the administrators, and faculty, and students of the historic Wabash College, to our invited, my friend, long time. And uh, colleague Stephen Jones, uh, who I know a little bit before he was you all's age, or <laughs> <a little> older, <laughs> to each and every one of the citizens of this community. Good evening. I cannot tell you um, what a pleasure it is to join you as we celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I want to thank my friend, where'd he go? There he is, Mayor Barton, for such a moving introduction. 
I was like, gee whiz, I'm glad this is being taped. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm sure my husband, Tommy, was sitting there thinking, I thought my wife was here. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I am honored to, that my husband was able to join me today. We don't, after we were uh, talking to Wendy earlier, we don't often get the opportunity to travel together. It has been a real treat to uh, challenge, to travel today uh, or yesterday to Crawfordsville to join me for the celebration. You know, as I was thinking about what I will talk to you about on this King's Day. I thought about a number of things. And because of Dr. King's vast body of work and um, his vast area of focus, there were many opportunities. I could certainly talk about his imploring the citizens of Montgomery, Alabama to walk toward justice during the Montgomery bus, bus boycott. I could talk about his admonition of his fellow members of the clergy for their activism uh, against racism in his lecture from the burning at Penn Dale. Then we talk about the um, often quoted and sometimes misquoted speech that I have to bring speech from the March on um, Washington. But I would argue, and AJ and the president have already referenced, that these are challenging times. And, and I would even posit to you that the times that we are experiencing today are in many ways as troubling as the times that gave rise to Dr. King's leadership. After all, we are faced with some of the greatest assaults on our civil rights. Whether you're talking about the right to vote that many of us have taken and mistaken for granted and our inability as a country and the inability of Congress to pass what seems to be a Voting Rights Act or when you talk about the assault of state legislatures on our right to vote. After all, in the 2021 legislative session, we have seen 440 bills that have been proposed in 49 legislatures across this country that have limited or attempt to limit our right to vote. But whether you're talking about the peril that address that limits people's ability to sleep, walk, jog, or in some instances exist without fearing for their lives as we think about the memories of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, the list that is too long to be able to recount in one sitting, or if you look at the gun violence that imperils 
are urban centers such as Indianapolis and Chicago and Louisville and here. Given all of those dangers, I want to talk to you about the fierce urgency of now that Dr. King referred to it. And I have to tell you that as concerned as I am, the last day and a half, spending the time with the students of Wabash College and the adults who encourage you. I am hopeful. And it's because of that hope that I want to underscore something that AJ alluded to earlier that a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And as our hope for the future, those of you who are students, whether you're at Wabash or in high school or at some other college, have a responsibility to those seen and unseen. And so I want to challenge you, I want to implore you, I want to encourage you to fulfill that responsibility through the demonstration of scholarship or education, heart, and courage. Who I mean? After all, we're in institutional higher learning, so you are clearly in a pursuit of education. I hold up education because I would suggest to you that you don't want to stop here. Um, you know, some of us pursue education until the next exam or until graduation, whether it's from Wabash or from grad school. But I would suggest to you that a lifelong pursuit of learning, a lifelong pursuit of intellectual curiosity, a lifelong pursuit history and knowledge is imperative to lead in these times. You need knowledge and education because you need to know when people are providing misinformation. You need knowledge and education because we have heard from Winston Churchill, as he quotes George Santana, or as he paraphrases him, that those without knowledge of history are doomed to repeat. And you need that knowledge of education and that intellectual curiosity because sometimes in your pursuit of leadership, you want to ask the rhetorical question, not why didn't we or why can't we, but how might we? So I would say you need education. The second thing that I would suggest is that you need heart. Who I mean by that? Heart, the ability to keep going in the face of obstacles. Now you're young, and so I know you haven't seen 
many obstacles, but if you take an assessment piece, if you pass a difficult class, if you had to stay up all night, and I suspect a few of you have, <laughs> then you understand what it means to have heart. When David got in the arena with Goliath, he was demonstrating heart. And there are some challenges that you have faced and will continue to face that requires you to have heart. We've seen examples of the need for heart as our nation has experienced turmoil. Whether you talk about the civil unrest that we saw in the summer of 2020, or whether you talk about the insurrection or threat against our capital that you saw in January of 2021. Sometimes, even in the face of the greatest intellect, you need an extra dose of heart to lead to and to help you achieve success. And then, I would suggest to you that you need courage in these days of time. Now, I mean, what's in heart and courage? Aren't they really the same thing? What do you mean by that? Well, I would suggest to you that courage is different because while heart is an inner or intestinal fortitude, courage often manifests itself outwardly. Sometimes you have to have the courage to have difficult conversations. We've all had that experience, I would argue, over the last year, where you hear somebody say something and you Knowing the heart of hearts is not quite right or not quite accurate or not quite fair or not quite good, but in another day and time, you might have just quietly reflected to yourself that well, that's not really right. But now I would say that we're counting on your generation. To have courage. I was talking to Zenon earlier and he was talking about the fact that he wanted to be a CFO one day. And we discussed the fact that because of his aspirations as a CFO, he might find himself in a C suite where he might be required to have an unpopular conversation. That's courage. And that's the type of courage that these days and times call for. You also need courage to be able to say that even though I may disagree with you. It does not mean that I will vilify you or deify myself because I'm thinking that I've taken the moral high ground. I just have the courage to engage in difficult discourse so that we will understand each other and can work on a solution together. One of the things I think we have to understand in this day and time is that there are many ways 
multiple ways to solve a problem. And while we may not all choose the same way, it does not make mean that my way is more superior than yours. And so we have to garner that mutual respect for each other as human beings. And I would suggest that doing that often requires courage. Courage with a, an equal dose of humiliation. Because humility is important. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have swag. Mm -hmm. You should have soft, swag, right? But you also need to understand the importance of humility. Whether your source of that is either the mark or a daily reading of the Bible. As you pursue your endeavors, as you strive to make wild action places beyond a better place, whether you do that inside of the unique terrain and venue of the Malcolm X Institute, or somewhere else on campus, or somewhere else in Indiana, or the world. Don't be afraid to fail. Because you just told us all the good things that you do, and that you are recommending to be successful. One of the things that people rarely hear about with Dr. King is that he did not succeed every time. People rarely talk about it. When he led the march from Selma to Montgomery, the first time out, he failed. Now you can give all the reasons that it happened. But when everything was said and done, he and his colleagues, and there were many, were unable to complete that mark. Dr. Phillips, Dean Jones, the coaches Morgan, Reverend King, Dr. Drury, your teachers and the adults in your life. Sit down with them when you get a chance. You hear about their success. You see where they are now. Ask them about their feelings. I'll tell you about mine. <laughs> I often refer to myself as a recovering point guard. I played <laughs> basketball in high school and in college, baby, college. But I was an avid bitch fighter <laughs> in both places. When I got in the game, we had either secured the win <laughs> or were firmly on our way to a law. <laughs> I'll tell you about my failures. You heard in the introduction that I went to Harvard College and Harvard Law School. But as I prepared to graduate from law school, when all of my friends were getting jobs in the large law firms in New York and California, in Chicago, 
I didn't have a job offer. And so I ended up working at the Lake County, Indiana prosecutor's office. Now the story from there turned out okay. But the reality was that that was not the first job of my choice. You heard earlier about the offices that I had. But here's what you need to understand. I have run for elected office nine times. And at last count, I have lost more elections than I won. Ask people about their feelings. Because what they will tell you is that not only have they failed, but because they failed on their backs looking up, they were able to get and to try. And that's the best lesson about faith. That, and every time I think that something is so bad that it can't get any worse, I find that there is always a silver lining in the fire. And so today, I just want to encourage you to tell you that as successful as you have already been as students here at Wabash, as individuals in your chosen endeavors, the best is yet to come. I can't wait to hear about, read about your exploits in the future, the goods. <laughs> And what I will also tell you is that the best example, the best motivation of Dr. King and his legacy for all of us is that each and every one of us has a capacity. And so I would suggest to you that as you think about where you will go from here, what, will, what you will do, how much money you will earn, what you will drive, also think about how you will serve. Thank you, and uh, I'm